It's always a privilege to stand before the church, God's house, and be able to speak words of life coming from the Scriptures. I know we've just come from a, a season of prayer, but uh, I too, at this juncture, at this moment, I want to uh, continue in that spirit and bow my head in prayer before I speak. God, it is Your Word and not mine that makes any difference. It is Your Word that, brought, that brings forgiveness and provides hope. It is Your Word that can mean the difference between death and life. So, Father, may Your Word be heard in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago and uh, has been kind of referenced here today that I am uh, going through a series of messages uh, connected to the idea of forgiveness. Introduced it a couple weeks ago uh, and, and tried to establish uh, a baseline uh, for the importance of studying uh, the topic and the power and the mystery of forgiveness, that there's never a time that's unfruitful for us to delve into the depths of understanding forgiveness. It is the key reality of uh, the Christian faith and of our lives, and there's always more that can be learned, always more that can be appreciated about it. So I'm going to continue in on that theme uh, this morning with you today and, and as we move forward. Now, I begin my messages with a, a little interactive time with the kids. I call it a kid's quiz. I am going to do that this morning with just two little questions. I'm not going to have the mics going around, but if any of the young people would like to help, just raise your hand, uh, and I'll call on you, uh, but they are uh, a little more uh, simple or basic today. I just want to see if you can tell who these Bible characters are that I'm going to describe to you, all right? Who is this Bible character, okay? Let's see what we can know about him. He was betrayed by his brothers. His clothes were stolen. He was put into a pit, then he was sold as a slave, but he rose to be the greatest ruler on earth and eventually forgave his brothers. I only mentioned one or two of those and some of the hands started going up, but I do think I saw Benjamin's hand first. Joseph. He said Joseph. Is he right? That's right. Second Bible character now. Let's see if you can get this one. It might sound... I haven't even said it yet, Isaiah, but I like the anxiousness. That's good. This Bible character was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold for the price of a slave. His clothes were stolen. He was, pit, he was put in a pit we call a tomb, but he rose to become seated at the right hand of power and then forgave his brothers. Similar but different. Who am I talking about now? Any young people? I'm not, you got, I'm, oh wait, there's no PowerPoint today. You can't cheat. Ah. All right, I saw, Isaiah. okay, Isaiah and Eric, same time. Go ahead and say it. Now you're getting bashful. Isaiah, what is it? He said Jesus. Carson, what were you going to say? Okay, well, we can agree. We can agree. Isn't it interesting how similar the stories are, though? And we know that um, Jesus himself teaches us that all the stories of the Old Testament are there to illustrate and help us know the ministry and role of Jesus. Some characters in the Old Testament, they might have a more minor way of seeing the plan of Jesus in them. Others take up major sections of illustrating Jesus. And Joseph is one of the most uh, detailed lives that we get to see the ministry and, and trials and endurance and patience and story of the Messiah lived out through the life of Joseph. He's a, a fascinating character. We know an enormous amount about his life, and we can appreciate the story of Jesus or the, the precursor of what Jesus would go through through the life of Joseph. Now, we're going to talk about Joseph. If we're going to talk about forgiveness, Joseph is a great character to look at. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but of all the stories we know about Joseph, the narrative of Joseph in the Old Testament takes up, the bulk of it, takes up about eight chapters of Genesis, okay? 
Four of those chapters, though, 50% of the biblical narrative of Joseph are dedicated to him forgiving his brothers, all right? It's as though the entire narrative, the entire character of Joseph is in the Old Testament. Yes, the ordeals that he goes through before, the betrayals and the imprisonment and and all those things will will refresh our memories on, on Joseph here in a minute. Those are there also for our instruction and learning, but it's all building to the reality of the forgiveness that Joseph would display towards his brothers, which is another uh, realization of who Jesus was. All the things that Jesus did, all the ministry that He did, all the sermons that He gave, all the miracles that He did were building up to the moment of forgiveness that He would accomplish on the cross. So the same is true with Joseph. We're given such amazing information about Joseph, not just so that we can appreciate, you know, the trials of, of, of sibling rivalry and endurance through, through persecution and, and things like that, but because it's building towards a character development and a story that is necessary for our appreciation and understanding regarding forgiveness. So let's just remind ourselves a little bit about the story of Joseph for a moment. This is in the book of Genesis. We'll turn to a specific passage here in, the, in, in a moment, so keep your Bibles handy. You'll, you'll see I'm not using… As a matter of fact, can we go ahead and put the screen up? Uh, whenever we can see the stained glass cross, I think that's a good thing. So go ahead and put the screen up. So we're going to go, go to our Scriptures here in just a little uh, bit, but let's just re- remind ourselves who Joseph was in the Bible. First of all, he was an arrogant, spoiled teenager, wasn't he? But, you know, you kind of repeat yourself when you talk about a teenager in this. No, no, that's terrible. The Bible really uh, uh, lets us see the faults of young Joseph as he's growing. He is overly uh, blessed by the father and uh, by Jacob, and he's spoiled. He's arrogant to the point that his elder brothers hate him. And when I say hate him, I don't mean like hate like when we say I hate broccoli. I'm talking about the biblical hate. A hatred that Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart towards your brothers, you are guilty of the hellfire uh, because it's the same as the guilt of murder. They had murderous hatred for Joseph. To, and not just in their feelings and emotions, they act on it. They plan to attack him, they plot his demise, and they put him in a pit planning to kill him. And I, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm skipping over a good bit of detail. Uh, you can get more into it in the book of Genesis later if you need to fill in some of the gaps and some of the other stories. But these are the essential details. Do you remember this, folks? Do you remember the, the story of Joseph? So imagine the scene right now. Joseph is 17 years old. All the brothers throw him in a pit, some kind of a miry pit that he can't get out of, and the, the, the grotesqueness of this story escalates because the very next thing the Bible says that happened is they sat down to eat their lunch. Notice that uh, when, you, when you read in the narrative. You, you can look for yourself. They throw them in a pit, and then it says they sat down to have a meal. And not only that, we learn later in the story of Joseph, not only did they sit and eat a meal while Joseph is in a pit trying to figure out what's going on, Joseph begins to cry out to them in their hearing. He begins to plead for mercy. Now, you can imagine in the beginning, this spoiled teenage brat was probably saying things like, you guys better let me out of here. I'm going to tell dad. You're going to be in big trouble. He's going to take away the keys to the car. You're not going to be able to do anything when I tell dad what you've done. You know how none of you have ever heard a spoiled person before? That's kind of what they sometimes sound like. So he probably began with those types of things, but at some point, Scripture makes it clear. At some point, the weight of the moment fell on the shoulders of this 17-year-old uh, young man, and he understood his brothers were not joking. They were intending to kill him. And the Scriptures talk about how he cried out for mercy as they ate their lunch. This is, this is dirty stuff, folks. The Bible doesn't hide the problems there were in the family of God. So, as they are planning on what to do, and there's a, a different elements happening, they happen to see a caravan of slave traders, and greed overcomes their malice, and they say to one another, what profit is it just to kill the lad? Why don't we sell him? He'll go off it. How long can this spoiled brat live as a slave? He's probably going to die a slave wherever these slave traders take him anyways. Why don't we go ahead and profit from it? We're going to be fine. They haul him out of the pit, okay? 
They take him to these slave traders, they sell him, and then they watch him fade across the horizon in chains as he's pleading and crying, and they're waving goodbye. The depth of the offense of the brothers of Joseph is about as deep as you can imagine. They don't ultimately kill him, but in some ways, uh, they do just as much of that in a spiritual and psychological sense. They have no plans of ever seeing Joseph again. They think that they have solved their problem with this arrogant younger brother. Fast forward 20 years. We're going to jump 20 years later. If you recall in the story, Joseph goes into Egypt. He goes through many trials. Okay, I mentioned there's four chapters about the life of Joseph before the brothers come back into the story, and then there's four chapters dedicated to Joseph processing forgiveness with the brothers. So he goes through some trials. He ends up in jail. I mean, as if it can't get any worse, you're already a slave, and now you're a slave in jail. But God is working with Joseph. God is molding Joseph. God is bringing into Joseph some character attributes. Joseph needed to be humbled. Joseph needed to go through some of these ordeals. I'm not saying that God planned or orchestrated this, but God, in His grace and mercy, was able to use this moment to build into Joseph some very necessary character um, qualities. So, Joseph is given the ability to understand signs and visions and dreams, and just like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh has this tremendous dream, and he knows that the gods are trying to talk to him, and he's looking for someone to explain what this dream is about, and Joseph comes to his attention. Joseph hears the dream, and he says, this is clear. You're going to have seven years of great farming and a lot of food, but after that, you're going to have seven years of tremendous famine. You better plan out how to survive that famine in the seven years of plenty. Pharaoh is so overwhelmed with the character of Joseph. Joseph is 30 years old at this point when he's interpreting the dream. Uh, Pharaoh feels convicted that he not only needs to believe Joseph, but God has given Joseph the ability to help Egypt survive. And Pharaoh makes Joseph the head man in the country. He even says, your word shall be as the word of Pharaoh. Now, remember, Joseph is a type of Christ. This is the same thing that Jesus was. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? It's the same thing with Joseph. If you see Joseph, you're looking at Pharaoh, right? This is what takes place now in Egypt. So, the seven years of plenty come. Joseph gathers all the grain. He puts it all up in silos. And now the seven years of famine come. And the famine is severe. Two years into the famine... So, Joseph is now 39 years old, if you're following the chronology. So, 22 years specifically after his being sold into slavery. The family of Jacob up there in Palestine cannot survive the famine. And so, Jacob sends the brothers into Egypt, and then uh, Joseph and the brothers will once more meet. Now, remember, as we understand that Joseph is is in the Bible to to, to see how God works out in these devastating circumstances and to help us see um, who Jesus is as well. Remember, Jesus, when He rose from the dead, He comes out of the grave just as Joseph came out of the pit. He comes out of prison, okay? And because of, of the favor that the Father has on Jesus, Jesus is seated at the right hand of power, amen? Then Jesus comes back down to earth remember, in the Gospels, to be reconciled with His brethren. Specifically in John 21, Jesus at the the seashore breakfast, if you remember that, Jesus gathers with a few of His disciples, and then He begins to speak to Peter. You remember that? And what does He ask Peter three times? Three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Now, Jesus knows all things, amen? Amen. Jesus knew what was in the heart of Peter already. Why did Jesus ask Peter three times, do you love me? Why did, Peter, why did Jesus test Peter? Why did Jesus ask for demonstrations of repentance if Jesus already knew Peter's heart? The same experience, the same reality of forgiveness we're going to look at in the story of Joseph and his brothers, because Joseph will also test his brothers three times. And in the presence, coming back now to Jesus, Jesus with his disciples reinstates Peter as a leader over his people by having him express these three confirmations of his love of Jesus. 
I always have more to share than I have, have time, but I, I feel like I, I need to segue in, into this for just a moment. When Jesus spoke to Peter, now we know when Peter denied Christ, it was bitter, it was devastating. You know, the people came to Peter, do you know Jesus is, in, uh, you know, uh, being tried, okay, and he's been arrested and it's terrible, and people come to Peter and say, aren't you with this guy? Peter said, I don't know who that guy is right? Do you remember the denials of Peter? This is what he denied Peter. Uh, Peter denied Christ three times, which is kind of why Jesus would ask Peter three times. But from everything we understand of the narrative of the, the betrayal of Peter, it was a private thing. There's no evidence that, that, that uh, uh, you know, the other disciples, that John was there or Nathaniel was there or Philip. It was a private thing. But when Jesus chooses to test the repentance of Peter, he does it within the context of his brethren. And it's a very interesting thing. Why didn't Jesus pull Peter aside in privacy and say, Peter, we need to have a talk? You know, remember that thing that happened? Boy, that was rough. I just need to know. You love me, brother? Oh, you do? Okay. Well, I need to hear it again. Do you love me? Okay. One more time, Peter, just between you and me. One more time. Do you love me? All right. We're good. That's not what he does. He does this, you know, the story of Peter's denials probably did not remain private. Jesus has Peter confirm his repentance, confirm his forgiveness in the presence of the other brethren. Notice this, the issues that we have with God, the issues that we have with one another, the issues that we have within the family of faith or in our marriages never remains private. Our forgiveness or lack thereof will impact those around us. It will. Now, I'm not trying to advocate that we broadcast our issues, that we publicize that's what's private. There will always be an aura of privacy and discretion in the biblical stories of forgiveness. But you'll also see a common element that there is always a necessity that the community itself gets to hear that reconciliation has taken place between two individuals because our lack of forgiveness affects our fellow man. Does that make sense? So in the presence of the other disciples, Peter is reinstated as a valued leader by his willingness to confirm his repentance and his love of Jesus Christ. Come back now with me to Joseph. Joseph is going to test his brothers three times. Oh, these are the stories I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when these happen. You can imagine Joseph. He doesn't look like a Hebrew anymore. He's been living in Egypt for 20 years, and for nine years, he's been part of Egyptian nobility. He doesn't, he doesn't speak Hebrew at this point. He's speaking the Egyptian language. He's dressed as an Egyptian, has an Egyptian headdress, probably has the jewelry of an Egyptian. He looks completely different. The brothers don't know who he is, but they're waiting in line for their grain. And Joseph is overseeing the process, and he sees his brothers come. Now here, notice this. Joseph, when he sees his brothers, he decides to test them as part of the process of forgiveness. You're going to hear me say this a lot. Forgiveness is more than just a momentary apology. Forgiveness is more than just an instantaneous reaction or a a decision that we make and therefore it ends it all. Forgiveness is a process uh, as much as it is a decision. I'm not saying it's not also a, a decision, but it is also a process. But notice this. We understand that there was already the germination of forgiveness in Joseph's heart when he sees his brothers because he would have had every right at the moment he saw them to imprison them and or kill them. Even by Mosaic law, by the lex talionis, the law of retaliation, retaliation, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, it was considered just and appropriate, if you murdered someone, then your life could be made forfeit. If you put someone into slavery, you yourself could be made a slave. Joseph would have been justified by seeing his brothers and saying, finally, I can have justice. Grab those guys, put them into prison. Now it's even. We're fair and square. He didn't. He would have been justified, but he didn't. The seeds of repentance, the seeds of forgiveness are already in his heart when he decides to test 
the character of his brothers. He threatens to put them in prison, but he eventually just keeps one hostage. He, he understood, okay, well, here's the problem. If I keep all my brothers in prison, the reason they're here is their family is starving. If I keep them all here, then my father and Benjamin and all the other… By the way, keep this in mind. The other brothers are married, and they have children back in Palestine. And so he understands, I can't keep them in prison as much as I'd like because then that means the the death of every other of my relatives. So he releases them, but he keeps Simeon as a hostage. And he says, don't come back unless you bring Benjamin, your younger brother. Again, they don't know it's Joseph. So again, I know I'm going fast here, but I know you're advanced Bible students and you know these stories already and you're staying with me step by step. So very good. So, fat, again, going through the story, uh, the brothers go back, but the famine continues to be severe. And as much as Jacob doesn't want to do it, he eventually has to send the brothers back to Egypt again. He's already lost Simeon. He thinks Joseph is gone. Jacob is just grieving about this. But he's like, we're going to die anyways. You guys might as well go back down to Egypt. If Benjamin has to go with you, I don't want that to happen, but I'm going to go ahead and send him. They come back into Egypt, and Joseph decides to test them a second time. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a minute and note another reality of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not demand demonstrations of repentance, but neither does it forbid it. We should not bristle that in our forgiveness process, if we've offended someone, that they would ask of us some demonstration of repentance. If, you, if, if someone loaned you a hundred bucks and you lost it and you didn't pay it back, and, and, but you apologize, and they, well, I forgive you. Well, can I have another hundred bucks? Well, I'll give you twenty-five. Twenty-five? What's that all about? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you forgive people. I guess you don't really mean it, do you? Right? You know what I'm saying? If you really want to appreciate the dynamics of forgiveness, we would not bristle or be spiteful that should someone we've offended in, a, you know, in a, 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 an acceptable manner, I mean, obviously, they, you can go overboard, but if they say, I, I'm not ready to come back to that part of our relationship until I see evidence. Forgiveness does not demand demonstrations of repentance, but it does not forbid it either. And those who are truly seeking reconciliation should be willing to go the extra mile to prove that they have been changed by grace. So the brothers come back. Joseph decides to test them a second time. And there's a lot of reasons behind how Joseph is orchestrating these tests. The first time he treats them as spies, he puts them in prison. The second time he says, no, you're not spies. You guys are great buddies of mine. Come on in. We're going to have a dinner together. So he has them come into their hall. And you can imagine he seats them in his royal palace. He gives them food. And I could just, again, I wish I was there. I can imagine they're eating their soup like, what's going to happen? You know, because their first meeting with the guy, he was pretty rough on him. But then he tests them by giving. He's so excited to see Benjamin. By the way, uh, Jews are emotional people. Joseph is crying the whole time during this story. He's getting overwhelmed with emotion all the time. He sees Benjamin, which was his only full brother, the other uh, son of Rachel. He's just overcome with emotion at the sight of Benjamin. But he tests his brothers, so he seats them down, and then he gives Benjamin five times the helpings and the servings and the blessings of the meal. And so all the other brothers, they get a little piece of cake, you know, but then Benjamin gets the whole cake, you know. And he's testing to see, has the animosity of my brothers towards the children of Rachel, towards the favored children of Jacob, changed? Will they treat Benjamin? I'm going to spoil Benjamin the same way I was spoiled, and I'm going to see how my brothers react. That was the test. They go through the dinner, and he says, okay, uh, he doesn't see, you know, what he needs to see. He says, I'm going to have one more test for my brothers. I'm going to send them home. But I'm going to put my precious uh, chalice, my drinking vessel, into Benjamin's bag. I'm going to hide it, and then I'm going to uh, surprise my brothers and catch them uh, with Benjamin with my chalice. We're going to see what happens. So the brothers leave Egypt. They got all their grain, and they're like, whoo, we got out of here, guys. That was weird, but we got out of here. They get right to the outskirts of the city, and then come the sirens and the police and the chariots racing them down, and they're arrested, and they're grabbed, and they're, what is going on? They say, one of you stole. Uh, by the way, they, they re- continually refer to Joseph as the man, the man, which is another interesting thing because Jesus is the son of man. One of you stole the man's chalice, 
No, no, we would never do that. Whoever's stolen that chalice, if they're found among us, let him die. So they start dumping the bags. Nope, nope, nope. They come to Benjamin's bag. Uh Uh-oh, what do we have here? And then they think, oh, it's over. We have sinned against God. We should never have done what we did to our brother. Again, they still don't know this guy is Joseph, and they just think their lives are over. They come before Joseph. Uh, Forgive me again. I know I'm racing through this story. They come before Joseph, and they say, we can't explain it, but we we understand you're going to make us slaves. And Joseph says, no, 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 no. Uh, That wouldn't be right. Only the one who stole from me is going to be my slave. Only this little brat, Benjamin. I'll tell you what. I'll take him off your hands. Uh, let me just have, I'm going to make him the slave. You guys go back to your families. Now, notice Joseph is testing them again to see if they go, oh, what a great idea. We're going to get rid of Benjamin. We already got rid of Joseph. Now we get to get rid of Benjamin too. This is wonderful. Good job. Yes, we agree to that situation. Take this kid as your slave. We don't want him. And then they're going to march home. to. Sorry, Dad, I know it's rough, but more inheritance for us. He's testing their character. Judah takes a prominent role in this, and he appeals to Joseph, and he says, don't let this happen. It'll cause death to my family. Death, Take me. Take me instead. And in this moment, Judah also becomes a type of Christ. Take me instead. Now, I promise you we come to the Bible, and I want to jump to it in Genesis 45. So we've already had three chapters of this you know, uh, situation between Joseph and his brothers, but you need to hear how this story ends and how it applies to our lives today. After three dramatic tests or demands of demonstration of character, Genesis 45, this is now right after Judah has said, take me as a slave, not the young Benjamin. So I hope you're at least into the story to kind of get where we're at. Genesis 45 and verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself. Then Joseph could not control himself. Joseph becomes overwhelmed with forgiveness to the point it was no longer Joseph acting. It was the Lord. Forgiveness is a power that does not begin in you. Forgiveness is a power that comes from God. And if you think it is you pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, pulling the merit out of your own heart, I'm going to do it because I'm such a good guy, you miss the point altogether. Through this dramatic sequence of events, Joseph loses the ability to resist forgiveness anymore. And God begins to work the power of forgiveness through Joseph. He cried out before those who stood before him, have everyone go away from me. So there was no man known with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Again, privacy, but not secrecy. Privacy, but the, but the family needed to experience this moment together. Now, notice verse 2, extremely important in the story and understanding of forgiveness. Joseph wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Now, this is not in the Scriptures just to create an emotional moment of, oh, isn't that tender, warm, cushy feeling, and all that. The household and the land and the people of Egypt become aware of the moment that Joseph is doing this with his brothers. What they hear is a man forgiving. Joseph would become known throughout the land as one who has been reconciled with his brothers. 
He's already known throughout the land as a person of wisdom, a person of, of, you know, of knowing God and being able to bring bread and salvation. But in this moment, what the Egyptians needed to hear was that he was a man who forgives. This is very important as we go through the dialogue. Verse 3, then Joseph said to his brothers, <laughs> he, he's been speaking probably through an interpreter before now, and then he opens up his mouth in Hebrew. Guys, I'm Joseph. Now, how, how deep do you think their jaws dropped? You, the, the shock, the overwhelming. I mean, I want to see the DVD or the Blu-ray or the hologram in heaven of this moment whatever the Lord has in the record books. As He begins to speak to them, and He pulls, I'm, I'm just assuming, you know, He pulls off the, uh, the, the pharaonic headdress and, and begins to speak, how is my father? Tell me what's going on. But notice what happens. They're not happy. They're not happy that it's Joseph. It says, His brothers could not answer Him, for they were dismayed at His presence. Why? They didn't know what was in His heart. They thought, this is the grand reveal. We're about ready to really take a beating for what we've done. And Joseph knows that. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. Oh, this is the same as when Jesus revealed Himself to His disciples after the resurrection. And they were, you know, and, and they didn't know it was Him. He says, come closer to me. See, feel the nail prints. Feel my side. It is me. Joseph does the same thing. Please come close to me. See that it is I. Uh, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery into Egypt. He kind of buries the knife maybe just a little bit, right? You remember what you did? Yeah, that's me. But now verse 5. The one who had been so grossly offended because of the power of God working in his life and the power of forgiveness overcoming him, he begins to comfort those who had done this devastating thing to him. He becomes the comforter, which is another word for the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Do not be grieved. Verse 5, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. You sold me here, but God sent me before you to preserve life. Another little uh, biblical attribute of forgiveness. When we forgive we recognize that despite the pain, despite the challenge, God had never abandoned us. It is a recognition of the plan of God when we forgive, which the inverse of that is when we don't forgive, is that we reject the power of God and the presence of God in our lives. When we don't forgive, we reject the idea that God is working in our lives. Joseph recognizes that despite the circumstances, God has sent me, verse 6, for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there's still five years in which there's neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse 7, very important church. Joseph says to his brothers, God sent me before you to preserve for you a, do you have your Bibles? What's your Bible say there? Posterity? It's the word remnant. It can be translated different ways, but this is the very first time the word remnant appears in the Bible. And Joseph says, God has orchestrated this moment. God has helped me endure this devastating thing so that a remnant would be preserved in the land. Now, for those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, that term remnant has deep meaning. It's used all throughout the prophets. It goes right to the end of the uh, book of Revelation. We are the remnant people here today. That's our belief. We are the remaining people, you know, holding to the faith as best as we understand it, revealed through the Scriptures and through the Holy Spirit. We are the remnant, and I'm a happy Seventh-day Adventist. The, the book of Revelation identifies the remnant as having two characteristics. They, okay, I'll tell you. They keep the commandments of God, and they hold to the faith of Jesus Christ, and we celebrate that. We believe that. But in Joseph's context, the thing that would identify the remnant at that moment and through that experience was that they were a forgiving people. It was that that defined the community of faith. The remnant that was to be preserved was a people who were forgiving and forgiven. Now, that is not contradictory 
to the identity of the remnant in Revelation. But any people who, who claims to keep the law of God and claims to be, have the faith of Jesus Christ but does not have forgiveness is not the remnant. I'm going to lose my voice. <clears throat> I kind of think this is important. It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter the dreams that you can interpret. It doesn't matter that you have survived and gone through great ordeals. If you do not forgive your fellow man, if you do not forgive and have a spirit of forgiveness in your heart, you are not the remnant. God has preserved on the earth a people dedicated to having the grace of God transform their lives that they could be not only recipients of forgiveness from God, but that they could be conduits of forgiveness to their fellow man. If Joseph could allow the Holy Spirit and God to mold in his heart the ability to forgive his brothers in that terrible situation, friends, he can do it for you today. Now, I know when people offend us or, when, or maybe we've been the one offending, it can be like death. It can be the death of a relationship. It could be the death of a career. It could be, it has the ability to create devastating results in our life. But God is a God who can restore life from death. And He wants to do it through forgiveness, church. He wants to do it. It doesn't mean the offense is okay. It doesn't mean that things are swept under the rug. We'll look at further elements and parts of forgiveness as we go on on this journey. But learn from the story of Joseph. It's okay to allow the process of forgiveness to develop as you interact with those who've harmed you. But let the power of God work through you. Don't let it be your own strength. Same thing with Corrie ten Boone in the story of her having to forgive that Nazi guard. It was the power of God that had to come into her life. You're going to hear me ask it. Do you need to be forgiven today? Not just between you and the Lord. We need His grace and mercy every day. But is there a fellow church member, family member, co-worker, friend? Either you or them can explore that moment together. Ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life. Don't be an inhibitor to what God wants to do in your life. Let Him help you, and you will experience a greater depth of love of God and of life than you've ever experienced before. Reconciliation is the power of God. We're going to close with a song right now, so I'm going to invite Jaylene to come up, and she'll close the service for us. Think about these things and continue to pray what God wants to do in your heart when we talk about forgiveness each time we gather.